Date and welcome. My name is Nijoni Chow Garcia. I'm the Associate Director in the Office of Inclusive Excellence, and I am so thankful to be joining you virtually, albeit physically, on the traditional ancestral homelands of the Eslam people to share the results of the distance learning experience um, student survey. I'm joined here today um, by my wonderful survey team. Um, that's Brian Corpening, AVP Inclusive Excellence. Sarah Dolan, Research and Instruction Librarian, Heather Hager, Assessment and Undergraduate Research Associate from UROC, Quentin Sedlicek, uh, STEM Education Postdoc Fellow with UROC, Ibrahim Shelton, Lecturer, Service Learning, TLA, OIE Liaison, and our wonderful student liaison, Vicky Ardaz Garcia. So a little context with regards to timing. The survey was administered the last day of the semester and after the semester ended. And it captures a very specific moment in time, namely May 15th to June 15th, which was a confusing and stressful uh, period in student lives. And it really might have been the first opportunity to process this transition or even vent frustration. The objective of the survey is, quote, that your responses will help us to continue to improve courses and student support services. So this should not be interpreted as an, eva as an evaluation of distance learning, but instead as a way to gather more information about how we can better support students in this online fall semester uh, during a pandemic. In terms of survey design, this was adapted from the EDUCAUSE survey, and we solicited um, feedback from campus leadership that included the Otter Promise team, the President's Committee on Equity and Inclusion, Cabinet, among others. Survey topics included challenges and concerns about distance learning, access to support services, accessibility and technology, and then these three were additions based on feedback that include environment, instructor support, and interest in virtual engagement. So we will present means and frequencies in this presentation. So average responses on a Likert scale and percentages of students responding in that category. Uh, another note that qualitative responses were coded by the team for emergency. In terms of the respondent profile, the sample ref was pretty reflective of the CSUMB population in terms of demographics, class standing, and discipline. There's a 15% response rate, so just over 1,100 respondents to the 78 questions. 45% of the respondents identified as students of color, 47% uh, Pell eligible, 52% as first generation, 75% self-identified as female, 24% as male, and a little less than 1% as non-binary. I'm going to transition over to my colleague, Heather, who's going to cover the next couple of slides. Go ahead, Heather. Thank you. Um, so the first set of survey questions asked students um, about to what degree have the following learning and educational issues been a challenge since the transition to remote learning. So you can see that the highest rated challenges were a preference for face to face learning difficulty focusing or paying attention in uh, remote instruction and personal motivation or desire to complete coursework during this time. The items that were uh, least challenging to students uh, were competing class meetings and schedules or uh, instructor availability. So those were less challenging to students, though most of the questions we asked about were at least somewhat challenging to students. We also asked a open-ended part of this question that um, Ibrahim will tell us about the qualitative analysis of. Yeah, thanks, Heather. So uh, there are a lot of challenges that were presented uh, when it comes to learning and education. So uh, we, what we did was try to, uh, you know, uh, get the, the voice of the people with the qualitative sides to see what exactly the quantitative data meant, but like put it in the human side to it, right? So the question to what degree have the following learning educational issues or challenges been uh, challenging for you? since the transition to, to remote work learning. Uh, uh, one of the things that was said was uh, in this, this first quote here, being, an actual, being an, an actual class environment with physical students for discussion, friendship, exchange with professors and discipline, uh, attending and completing outside work is far more beneficial than the online method. 
online classes tests and, and tests are tedious. Uh, there's a lack of true education because of the student. Uh, me just wants to get through the work, answer the questions and complete it. The structure is not forgiving and often confusing, asking questions that do not match the written material or are not located in the same section. So a lot of different things came out from uh, these type of uh, qualitative analysis. Uh, with the online course and design delivery, one of the examples uh, from uh, that came from factors that impacted students and motivation and in instructional methods and environments and lack of access to reliable tech. Uh, one of the comments that, uh, that uh, some of the participants in the theme came about was uh, times of classes have no longer been mandatory for participation in some classes. Uh, this has led me to decrease motivation for the course and led to confusing uh, office hours and assignment dates. So this idea of having decreased motivation was something that was very loud from the data. Uh, I'm gonna kick it back to Heather uh, for the next part. Thank you. So in the next question, we asked students about what they were concerned about in the transition to remote learning. And we see that students were concerned about their grades and performance in class, about losing that peer interaction, and about how this might affect their graduation or completing their program. I also wanted to make a note about time tests because though this fell in the middle, on average, we see that students with greater economic hardship and students with um, difficult internet connectivity, that that was actually a much higher issue, challenge for them because of the possibility of their internet cutting out during a time test. So that one had, uh, some differences in responses. On the next slide, we also asked students about concerns related to employment, food security, and housing. And we can see that for the majority of students, um, over 60% were concerned about employment. And this um, survey was conducted in April or in May to June. So um, that number may have increased as national unemployment numbers go up also. Um, we also see that around 40% of students are concerned about food security and housing security. Um, those were all also significantly higher for lower income students, so for Pell eligible students. On um, this next set of questions, we asked about how have students been able to access support services since the transition to remote learning. And we see that students rated advising and financial aid services as the easiest to access, even after transition to remote learning. Whereas services like uh, mental health services, health services, and service learning were more difficult in a remote environment. When we look at that same question, but with the percentage of students, we can see that the most frequently used or um, reported that those services were needed um, were advising emergency financial aid and financial services. And um, I wanna note a couple things. Uh, for one, uh, low-income students and Pell eligible students were significantly more likely to report, report needing almost all of these services, um, with the exception of uh, service learning and um, mental health services. They were the same on those. And also reported that they found them easier to use. So they were accessing these services more and reporting that they were fairly easy to access. Um, I also want to note that this isn't necessarily a reflection of how much students will use these services in the fall, since we're really talking about the end of last semester when we went remote. Um, there may be more need for these services in the upcoming fall semester. In the next set of questions, we asked students about um, issues with technology that have been challenging in remote learning and um, instructor discomfort or lack of familiarity with required technologies, their own access to reliable internet services and access to library resources had the highest proportion of students that viewed those as challenges. Um, not having a adequate replacement for face-to-face -face interaction had the highest proportion of students who felt strongly. So 28% of students reported that was a, a large challenge for them. 
Um, Pell eligible students rated all of these challenges higher than their peers, except for the instructor access to internet. Um, and their own access to reliable devices, reliable internet and library resources were the um, highest proportion for low income students. We also had a qualitative portion of this question that Ibrahim will tell us about. Yeah, thanks, Heather. Uh, so yeah, from uh, technology is something that was really loud in the data as well. Uh, when we started uh, finding the themes that emerged from what what the people were saying. So uh, access to technology, uh, students need increased access to and improved communication regarding available technology, right. Uh, and as Heather stated before, uh, uh, if you're more likely to be uh, on a lower income still, technology is a problem, you know, so we have to make sure as a university, we're, we're doing what we can to, to help uh, assist our all of our students in an equitable way. So one thing that that came out, I'm going to just say this first quote right here, and hopefully you'll have time, you can pause this video and reflect on what this what this information means for you and for us as a university, right? Some of us poor homeless students without personal or home based internet access really miss the 24 seven availability of computers in the CSUMB Tanimura Anto library cafeteria on the first floor which was abruptly terminated on the second or third week of the stay at home place quarantine. While it was uh, still open during the opening weeks of the quarantine, I was able to observe all the students using the computers. They were maintaining at least six feet of social distancing or they were sitting at, down at their own PC, right? Uh, the remaining uh, uh, voices that came out that makes the, the quantitative data come alive more, that put, puts the human face to it or the human voice to it talks about the same things that Heather mentioned, only in more detail, internet problems, not having the, the right access, um, uh, you know, having the, the interactions and the, 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 necess the, the necessary uh, space that we need, textbooks that need to be here with us and available and accessible in the, in the e-space. So I'll kick it back to you, Heather, to, to keep uh, uh, helping us understand more about this information. Thank you. Um, the next topic of the survey was about environmental related issues. So um, students home environment or wherever they're learning now that they're not learning on campus and students rated not be able to keep a regular schedule, not having a quiet place to study and family or roommate expectations of um, what else they should be doing while at home as the, the greatest environmental challenges. I also want to note that um, having to care for children or siblings or other relatives was a concern for more than half of the students and a major concern for 29% of students. Over 40% of students also had challenges regarding balancing helping children or siblings with their remote schooling, which is something that it sounds like we'll be working, students will be, still be facing that same barrier in the fall. On average, uh, Students who were Pell eligible rated all of these environmental related issues significantly higher, except for the keeping your regular schedule, which they were on par with their peers with. Um, and then Ibrahim will tell us about the qualitative results in the follow up to this question also. Yeah, so environmental stress is real. It's something that we got to remember as us as faculty and us at CSUMB have to be mindful of what we're assigning and probably focus more on quality rather than quantity and be, you know, very cognizant that people are doing uh, th their work in home spaces. So environmental stress is a real thing. Uh, and I'm just going to read this middle uh, one right here just to help us understand that the voices of the people matter and it really makes it come alive. Uh, and and the, these things were very loud in the data as well. It wasn't just a one-off, but there were themes that kept coming up over and over again. So these are just examples. Uh, this was one, hands down, one of my worst experiences at CSUMB. I have five younger siblings and I help my parents out when I'm home and staying afloat with all my work from home was extremely difficult. I cannot do online for my house, nor do I think it's worth it to pay all that money for me to be sitting in my house and my PJs, not getting the quality of learning that I would in person. So. Uh, ideas like it's in a toxic environment, hard to focus at home. Uh, my family had to hide in their bedroom so I could listen in peace for three hours of a class. So that also, uh, you know, you know, when I go back to that point of having quality, 
uh, instead of quantity, right? As us instructors and professors really have to be cognizant that we aren't in the same space anymore. And the things that we assign to students really have to really have quality involved in them rather than piling on a lot of stuff that's gonna take hours and hours of time or sitting around with hours and hours of Zoom sessions. So that has to be really uh, thought about in uh, using the uh, you know, synchronous and as asynchronous approach to this is gonna probably be the most beneficial. Uh, okay, I'm gonna kick it back uh, to you, I believe, Heather. Thank you. Next, we asked students about what actions their faculty took in the transition to remote learning to help them. And I wanna make a note that this isn't a comprehensive list of all of the helpful actions faculty could have taken or even the best pedagogical actions. Um, what it is based off of is a pilot data with over 400 students that we asked what their faculty did in the transition that was helpful. And then we created a multiple choice question based on that. So these are generated by students as helpful actions from faculty. And we can see that the vast majority of students said that at least some of their faculty, like over 90 percent, said that they had at least some faculty take helpful actions for these specific helpful actions to support them. And students rated flexibility with course deadlines and flexibility with course requirements um, as the most helpful, along with um, consistent communication. And we can see that flexibility with course requirements, students felt was very helpful, but that was also the um, one that had the fewest number of students who said they had faculty to do that. Um, making course content more accessible and the instructor being more available to student were also very highly rated. And then um, Ibrahim will tell us about the qualitative portion of instructional support also. Yeah, so instructional support, no, we, I mean, a, a baseline of it we have to care. I mean, just like we do any type of uh, teaching, you know, it's a it's a helping caring profession. So if we stop caring because the environment changed and we're going to lose a lot of people. So we got to be flexible. We have to be understanding of where they are in the situation there that they're in. Uh, being empathetic, uh, but but still having high expectations for our students, right? Uh, it's very very important, right? Uh, it's not all doom and gloom, right, this this survey. So a lot of things came back and a lot of people, and a lot of professors who use these ideas of being flexible, understand, understanding, caring, and, and being really engaged and, and being accessible and communicating effectively is super duper important. So uh, I'll just read this middle one. Take a second, if you can, pause the video, take a look at what the specific departments and people that were mentioned uh, uh, the, I believe the psychology department, the STEM department program had a lot of good shout outs from, from, uh, from the people. Uh, and, and here's the one thing I just read and I'll keep going, right? Um, I think the most important thing that helped me be successful during the remote learning has been my professional's flexibility with assignments and fast communication between students and professors. So uh, if we're thinking as professors that we can just, you know, have, you know, no office hours or no contact or don't email or don't outreach, or if a student disappears, we just let it go. Uh, we really have to be more proactive and really reach out on our side, but, you know, it's like a kind of a bee flower symbiotic relationship with student teachers. You know, students got to do work, but we also got to be available. You know what I'm saying? If we expect students to have things in on time, then uh, we should also be uh, available for times with office hours and such with questions. I mean, it's like a one plus one thing. We can do this, all right? And I think I'm throwing it back to you, Heather. Let's see what happens. Thanks. Um, the last set of questions asked students about what type of virtual engagement activities they would be interested in participating in in the fall. So um, we can see that the highest rated interests were in workshops, exercise activities, and guest speakers. Um, students who were Pell eligible were generally more interested in all of these activities and significantly more interested in virtual tours, music hours, guest speakers, game nights. Zoom office hours and trivia nights. So more of the um, social and kind of fun activities also. And then Vicki is gonna give us a, an overview of all of these results to sum it up. Hi, um, so I'll be talking about um, the distance learning survey 
um, infographic. Um, it's basically a general overview of the different ca categories um, that were that were surveyed. Um, and these will be posted online once final content edits are made. Uh, so overall, students faced many challenges, especially those that were eligible in the transition of distance learning, especially in the areas of um, learning, education, technology, other concerns, and environmental stress. Amongst these academic, technological, and basic needs related concerns, I do want to highlight one in particular. In the environmental stress quadrant, which reiterates that more than half of students had to, had to care for students, siblings, or other relatives. With the recent decision by um, area K through 12 schools to continue online learning, this will be an increasing issue for our students. Uh, so still, the vast majority of students said that at least some of their instructors took supportive actions. In some, we believe that it is imperative that we utilize the data to inform our decisions on how to better support students in the online fall semester and beyond. So now I want to pass it over to Sarah. Great, thanks. So what we have next are some preliminary recommendations that we created based on the survey results. And the first is to, of course, maintain empathy for the challenging environment in which students are working certainly including their home environment and the serious concerns they have about their employment and basic needs being met. And of course, these have implications for students' mental health. The next recommendation is to increase access to technology, certainly for students, but in some cases for faculty as well. Um, internet connectivity is a big concern that could be addressed by access to Wi-Fi via parking lots, computer labs, hotspots, or other types of accessible or outside spaces. Um, and also hardware, laptops, um, computer labs, and software such as specialized software that students might need for their, their various classes, and eBooks that are accessible um, at, for distance learning as well. Um, the next is to seriously consider and be very sensitive to student requests. Um, for reduced tuition and student fees, as these things are certainly um, burdensome to students at this particular point in time. Also to focus student support in the areas where they have expressed the most interest, such as professional development activities and those services that they um, most often need to access, like advising, financial aid, PGCC, et cetera. As far as professional development for faculty is concerned, um, there appears to be a need for both effective pedagogical instruction and also technical support for online instructional problems. There also could be some guidance about how to do service learning, internships, et cetera, in a distance learning environment. And finally, um, there is an ongoing need to provide campus communication to the entire campus community. So in terms of our next steps, one additional thing that this group can do is to conduct subgroup analyses. Um, this is something that Heather has already been breaking down these results by college and by Pell eligibility, but it is possible to perform additional analyses if there is a group of particular interest. We also want to respond to any feedback that we get. Um, and we will be collecting feedback on what the most useful next steps will be. And would also like to know if there are any additional questions that could be answered by this data. And finally, we plan to share the results more broadly, both um, with Extended Cabinet and with the wider campus community through the infographic and these slides and video. So thank you so much. Sorry, I didn't really know how to end that. <laughs> like, done, what are your questions? 